the audience was skimpy in Dallas. Uh, it's possibly because the Dallas Morning News refused to print our ads. Our consolation was a private swim party thrown at the fashionable Highland Park home of a gay doctor named, and I'm not making this up, Ben Casey. <laughs> Some of the boys did a very impressive nude water ballet to the music of T for Two. We stayed at the Ramada Inn in uh, Mesquite, Texas, the town that gave hairspray to the world. And we were a smash hit at the uh, Denny's there, where a waitress named Loyette, who pronounced her name Loyette, thinks uh, <laughs> we're the biggest thing since the death of Elvis. Uh, oh yes, we ran out of hot water at the Ramada Inn. 135 faggots without hot water. Uh, that's not a pretty scene. As luck would have it, the uh, friendliest place in town, though, was the steam room at the First Baptist Church, uh, an enormous complex that covers about four square blocks of downtown Dallas. A lot of organists hang out there, if you get my drift. Uh, P.S. Dallas men wear their muscles like feather boas. Now, that, believe it or not, is how Armistead Maupin, in the third volume of Tales of the City, described uh, a sidebar to the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus concert in Dallas that was hosted by the Turtle Creek Chorale in 1982. All of it true, to my knowledge, except for the name of the doctor and the neighborhood. The doctor who hosted the party was an anesthesiologist by the name of Rex Morgan, now deceased. His home was in Preston Hollow, not in Highland Park. Uh, Rex was a longtime and completely dedicated member of the Turtle Creek Corral. Uh, he was probably most noted, though, for his full body tattoos and other adornments. Uh, everything except his wrists and hands and neck and head, the only parts that showed when he was dressed in scrubs, was completely tattooed, solid. Rex was a painted lady. He was one of the most generous, most likable members of the Turtle Creek uh, Corral family. And uh, perhaps also remarkable concerning that San Francisco tour, unfortunately, was the financial catastrophe that it caused for that chorus. It almost brought them down. It reportedly threw several of their members into bankruptcy uh, because they had guaran uh, been guarantors of the costs. And it was only a few years later that the Turtle Creek Corral faced a very severe financial catastrophe of its own that very nearly brought the corral down. Uh, in its early years, the corral management was loose at best. Bills weren't being paid. Worst of all, neither was the Internal Revenue Service. In fact, the corral's manager was even quoted after all became known as saying, but we always needed that money for something else. <laughs> in, uh, in the mid-80s, when all of these difficulties became too big to hide any longer, uh, it seemed uh, that like it was pretty much too late. Uh, there would be no recovery. The IRS had come knocking and they wanted their payroll taxes. Uh, realizing this, the Corral's then artistic director, uh, Michael Crawford, knew that for his own best interests and for his family's best interests, he was gonna have to resign. And he did so during the 1986-1987 uh, season that resignation opened the door for a musical genius who had heard the chorale in concert in the ballroom of the Hilton Hotel on Mockingbird Lane, now the Hotel Palomar. That genius was a PhD by the name of Timothy Seelig, and he began a pursuit to become the chorale's fourth artistic director. Dr. Seelig did that, though, without really knowing the entirety of the Corral's dire financial plight. Uh, as he came to know more and more, he still continued his efforts to join the Corral. After a, a very rousing full Corral audition in the lower level of Thanksgiving Square, 
bringing the chorale a taste of that bombastic style that was uniquely his own. Selig was uh, overwhelmingly voted by the TCC members to become the next artistic director of the chorale. Michael Sullivan was then uh, the president of the chorale. He let Tim know that he was the chosen one. Uh, and there was also other news that he had to talk to Tim about. Uh, instead of the $50,000 annual salary, that was being paid to the artistic director with benefits. The corral could only afford a salary of $12,500 with no benefits. And the corral couldn't afford to pay moving expenses from Houston to Dallas for Tim. Tim took the job. For his first year with the corral, Tim commuted weekly from Houston to Dallas for rehearsals, and occasionally he stayed overnight in Dallas with friends. And in that first year with Tim Seelig, with his programming, with huge efforts at fundraising from everyone who was involved and everyone who deeply loved the corral, and uh, thanks to a little bit of magic worked by attorney Michael Kaufman with the IRS, the corral turned the corner to survival and broke even in that first year. One of the uh, financial angels that helped during that time was Rex Morgan, who, who I mentioned earlier. But even despite his generosity, the, uh, the TCC was so broke that at one board meeting, ironically, where we were sitting around a, a huge hand-carved boardroom table inside an incredibly uh, opulent showroom in the Dallas Design District, we on the board talked about whether or not we could even afford to have a season brochure that year. Um, I felt very strongly that we had to have a season brochure. Without a season brochure, there would really officially be no season, and soon after, there could be no corral uh, if nobody knew what was going on, what was planned. Um, uh, so what I did was dig into my pockets and pull out every piece of negotiable currency I could find, put it on the table and urge the rest of the board to do the same. It wasn't that much. Uh, other board members did uh, emptied their pockets and we wound up with about $300. And with that, the Corral's volunteer graphic artist, Don Bryant, uh, designed a one-piece trifold brochure that he had printed on red construction paper it was mailed, it was handed out, and we had a season. Uh, during that time, also, we were pleading for places to perform that wouldn't break the corral's bank. Um, I w happened to be on staff at Infomart, and the Trammell Crow resources were very, very kind to us. We sang at Infomart. Uh, we sang in various venues at the Anatole Hotel, including the old movie screening theaters, then on the uh, north side of the building and in the Stemmons Auditorium, then on the west side of the building, and also in the uh, now demolished Apparel Mart. Uh, I think we must have been something of a curse because all of those places have been torn down and they're gone. <laughs> uh, with Tim Seelig's genius, though, uh, coupled with Chris Anthony's taste meter for Tim and the uh, incredible dedication of the men singing, the corral's fame and the community support grew remarkably. And as audiences grew, finances improved. In fact, they improved so much that within five years, the corral had become a million dollar enterprise. Little did many of those. <laughs> Very little did uh, many of the people in the audiences or even a lot of the people in the corral know how close uh, the group had come to actual demise. Uh, a little more about Chris Anthony. That was his stage name. Uh, he was the corral's composer in residence. He really was the taste meter that kept uh, Tim Seelig's sometimes wild sense of creativity in check. Uh, Chris, whose real name was Bruce Allen Skipton, is forever memorialized as the composer of When We No Longer Touch, a cycle of songs for survival that debuted during the height of the AIDS crisis. Uh, the video story of that song cycle and Chris's struggle to get it finished as he was losing his battle with AIDS was produced by KERA 
and it brought Channel 13 and the Corral an Emmy Award. Uh, as far as I know, the only men's chorus in uh, the United States that has ever won an Emmy. And I was speaking with uh, Bruce Monroe earlier, and he mentioned that he was present at that concert where When We No Longer Touch was debuted. He was working at Channel 13 at the time. He went back to talk to Sylvia Komatsu, and, and uh, I believe her name was Jenny Martin, and provided them with tickets to go hear the next performance. They did, it became a video, the rest is history. Bruce Monroe was the catalyst that brought all of that about. Now, <laughs> after Chris died, uh, Tim turned his confidence and his trust to the inimitable John Thomas. Uh, the two of them became inseparable weekly luncheons and John Thomas became Tim's new taste meter. Obviously, the taste dynamic changed remarkably. Uh, John and I used to have frequently heated discussions about what was more important where the chorale was concerned. Is the message the music, or is the message the lifestyle? I think you all know where John would have come from. And I, I would all, almost venture a guess, if he were here today, that he and I would agree that the message is both. Uh, this, uh, this financial struggle to stay alive was really the first form of glue that kept the Corral united as a family. And the Corral has indeed been a family for all who have performed. The other glue that kept that family united, though, is one that's not quite so handsome. Uh, that second glue was the corrals growing up in the age of AIDS. Uh, in fact, since the corrals first lost to AIDS, tenor Charlie Miller in 1984, an entire corral has been lost to death. Um, the vast majority of those deaths due to AIDS. Uh, almost 200 men who have sung with the corral now sing from heavenly stages. At, at last count, I believe the exact count is 198. A few more snippets, not in any particular uh, chronological order. Uh, Tim Seelig and, and Broadway star Betty Buckley were, were friends from their high school days growing up in Fort Worth. And when Betty was invited to headline the opening performance of the 1994-1995 season, she agreed. That was a truly memorable evening of absolutely incredible music, but it was spiked a bit when Betty forgot the words to her signature song. Memory, <laughs> which she had done so, so many times as a member of the original Broadway cast in Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice's Cats. Betty stopped the song, she blushed, she apologized, she backed up a bit, she started over, and she knocked the audience out, just wowed them. Well, the next day, Betty had agreed to appear at a fundraising luncheon for major supporters of the corral. Uh, board members were also invited, and as the luncheon was closing, uh, Betty was asked if she would autograph some concert posters for the attendees. She graciously agreed, and when it was my turn, she asked me how I wanted my poster signed. I asked if she would sign it to the irony of memory. She instantly flashed this huge, huge, beautiful stage smile and between her teeth hissed directly in my face. <laughs> you bitch. <laughs> and then she signed the poster and to this day it proudly hangs on the wall in my office at home. In, um, in the late 80s and the early 90s, the Corral did exchange performances with several other gay men's choruses from across the country, uh, Indianapolis, San Diego, Seattle, Los Angeles, to name some. In 1992, the Los Angeles Gay Men's Chorus came to sing in Dallas. I had to miss that concert because I had business travel that I couldn't reschedule, and it was ironically travel to Los Angeles. Um, I arrived in L.A. late, got to my room on the 10th floor of the Weston Century Plaza, now a Hyatt, 
Uh, I was just falling asleep when everything started to rumble and move and act crazy. The television was about to fall out of the armoire. The shower door was clattering open and closed. Uh, little explosions were happening all over the horizon. I could see them through the window. And my bed was shaking. And I didn't remember dropping any quarters to any slots, and I didn't think I was in that kind of place. But then I realized uh, we're having an earthquake. Uh, it was the 7.3 Landers quake, and that was followed about three hours later by the 6.5 Big Bear quake. Uh, as soon as things settled down, uh, which was about dawn in Dallas, I relayed as much from the scene news as I could to TCC members in Dallas who were actually hosting people from Los Angeles, singers in their homes, and a number of those singers uh, uh, unfortunately did suffer damages caused by those two earthquakes. Uh, one year at a Christmas concert in the Stemmons Auditorium at the Anatole, uh, we started a music set with baritone Michael Harden and myself singing bass, doing an a cappella duet of the first verse of Silent Night sung in German, and we were followed by Robert Emery with his gorgeous voice of silk and velvet, picking up that same carol in English. Uh, midway through Robert's verse, an audience member right down in front was overtaken and went into an epileptic fit. It's not funny. <laughs> the show went on and Robert finished his verse and Tim became known for one of his signature moves, jabbing his forefinger in, into his chest and vigorously mouthing the words while we were singing, look at me. Look at me. <laughs> now, that also brings to mind Tim's second signature move, which I'm sure all of you who have been to chorale performances have seen at the end of a performance, actually at the end of almost every performance Tim has sung, and that signature move is... <laughs> the, uh, the Turtle Creek Corral is, is notable for so many things, and, and it has been for a long time. Um, it remains one of the most uh, known all-male choruses in the world. It's one of the most recorded male choruses of all time with more than 30 albums in its catalog. Uh, in 34 years, the Corral has only had six artistic directors, Cher, Fleming, Crawford, Seelig, Pallant and Jacobs. And that's really something of a record among volunteer choruses. There are thousands and thousands of stories from hundreds of men who have sung with the chorale. Much of the chorale's history is painstakingly organized into electronic archives and wonderfully recorded on the chorale's website, turtlecreek.org. I invite you to go take a look. Uh, that's been done through the tireless work of quite a few people, including Pat McCann, Chuck Sweat, Bob McCraney, and, and so, so many others. And um, there, what I've tried to include here are a few anecdotes that are not in that recorded history that might not be found anywhere else. I urge you to go to the Corral's website and read much, much, much more about the Corral's colorful past and I uh, actually urge uh, the, the Dallas Way to consider inviting other members of the Corral to come share their very unique experiences uh, in this incredible venue. The Corral has been such a strong part of the GLBT community for so long. Uh, it would be wonderful for others to be able to relay some of their stories. Uh, and, and many, many legends in the GLBT community have given selflessly to support and to advance the chorale sound, sometimes called uh, uh, a sound like nothing else on earth. Uh, they've given money, they've given time, they've served on boards and committees. Uh, George Emerson, when there was a very tough time with the chorale, started a group called the Noteworthies that was invaluable. Uh, Bud Knight and Chet Flake uh, started the annual auction uh, with, with Bud providing clearance items from uh, Lester Melnick stores that have made countless drag queens in incredibly pleased citywide. 
But one person, one person is most noteworthy, and that's our own Kay Wilkinson. Kay served. <laughs> Kay served for several years as the TCC board chair, the only woman ever to do so. And I'll close with a quick Wilkinson anecdote. At one point in her term as a board chair, Kay was diligently working, as she always is, to get more and more people involved in all of the volunteer activities that helped make the corral so well known and so well respected. During one rehearsal, Kay was standing on the podium at Salmon Center, talking to the entire gathering of men there in the room, pleading for their help with an important project. She opened her remarks from the podium saying, men, Men, I really, really need your help. I have this huge hole to fill. <laughs> there was no pregnant pause whatsoever, and to this day, there are corral members whose breathing patterns have still not returned to normal. <laughs> Thank you.